beautiful, light, and flexible, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was built like no other suspension bridge. It was unique in its design and incredible in its appearance. But on November 7, 1940, it all came crashing down. The collapse was one of the great tragedies in engineering history. Never had a suspension bridge so important met its end so catastrophically. But the Tacoma Narrows Bridge's true legacy was not in the frantic headlines generated by its collapse, but in the revolutionary changes it brought to the world of engineering and bridge architecture. That was Galloping Gertie's triumph. In the 1920s, America was prospering and optimistic. Skyscrapers and bridges were seen as symbols of elegance and power. Then, with the 1930s depression, cheaper and more efficient bridges were needed. As a result, bridges were made as simple as possible, graceful and slender works of art, beginning a trend towards light, flexible bridges. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was proposed to connect the Olympic Peninsula and the Washington mainland. The Washington State Department of Transportation appointed Clark Eldridge to design the bridge. Eldridge's plan was examined by an out-of-state engineering consultant, the world-famous suspension bridge designer Leon Mosef. Mosef suggested replacing the 25-foot-deep stiffening truss with an 8-foot shallow plate girder. Conforming to the trend, this lessened the cost of the bridge and gave it a slender, artistic appearance. In 1939, construction of the $6 million bridge began. On July 1, 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge officially opened. It was the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Thousands of people attended the ceremonies. Thousands more worldwide were intrigued by the bridge's extraordinary width-to-length ratio and its exceptional flexibility. But the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had an even more fascinating characteristic. Its bounce. Engineers were puzzled by these strange oscillations, but they did not doubt the bridge's safety. In fact, the bridge's movement attracted thousands of people who crossed the bridge just for the exhilarating experience of watching the car in front of them disappear. For this, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was quickly nicknamed Galloping Gertie. Galloping Gertie proved to have many more benefits. It linked the less developed peninsula to the industrial Tacoma area. There was rapid land development and population increase. The bridge also benefited the military, connecting the McCord Airfield and Puget Sound Navy Shipyard. All around, the bridge was a marvelous success, but Gertie began to run into problems. The engineers grew more worried about the bounce. Leon Mosef was contacted, but he assured them that it was not a problem. The engineers hired Professor F. Bert Farkarson at the University of Washington to build a scale model of the bridge and test it, while also studying the real bridge. We knew from the night of the day the bridge opened that something was wrong. On that night, the bridge began to gallop. Attempts were made to control the motion by installing hydraulic jacks and tie-down cables, but these proved ineffective. Farkarson observed a torsional twisting in the bridge model, different from the regular bounce. He recommended adding wind deflection devices, and preparations were made to install them. But the bridge did not meet nature's deadline. On the morning of Thursday, November 7, 1940, winds whistled across the narrows. The bridge was rolling two to five feet. Suddenly, the bridge went into a lateral twisting motion. The sides rose and fell 28 feet up and down every five seconds, tilting at a 45 degree angle. Leonard Coatsworth was on the bridge when it began its violent twisting. He got out of his car and fled the bridge. His dog Tubby was left in the car. Far Carson arrived to record the event. The bridge had been closed by officials alarmed by the dangerous motion. Observers were worried but very few expected what would come next. The first section of concrete from the center span broke off. The bridge began a violent motion. Steel girders twisted, cables snapped, lampposts broke off, and pieces of concrete fell. Then, two minutes later, a 600-foot portion of the center span plunged into the narrows. Howard Clifford, a newspaper photographer, was one of the last people on the bridge. It was bouncing so that the, I, I, it would go up where I was and then it would snap down so fast and I would, not, I would go down, drop as fast as that went down. 
I would be going down. This was coming back up, uh, and I, it, I hit, it hit me every time and knocked me down. Along with pieces of the deck, Leonard Coatsworth's car and dog fell. The dog was the only casualty of the collapse. 11.10 a.m. saw the end of it all. Galloping Gertie hung limp and broken. The hopes it had inspired had been crushed. The tragedy was complete. Gertie's collapse came as a shock to the public. Many people were angered, blaming it on faulty engineering. They felt that their tax money had been wasted, and more would be squandered for conducting studies and rebuilding. Nobody thought it would go down, no. I mean, if they thought it was going to go down, they would have closed it right away and tried to figure out what to do. Several committees were appointed to analyze the cause of the collapse. The Federal Works Administration set up a group of professional engineers. In March of 1941, they announced their findings in a report. Part of the problem was that the solid plate girders on the side caught the wind like sails. The original truss design would have allowed the wind to pass through harmlessly. Also, due to its exceptional width-to-length ratio, the bridge was extremely flexible and fragile. Still, the winds had not been overly powerful. In fact, they scarcely exceeded 42 miles per hour. So what did prompt it? As the wind passed over and under the bridge, it created vortex shedding, where wind eddies formed on the opposite side. These eddies gave small pushes to the structure. Although the force wasn't especially great, the vortices caused the bridge to sway rhythmically. Eventually its motion became self-excited, meaning that it propelled itself. The bridge's drastic motion was caused by harmonic resonance. The basic idea is that everything vibrates at a natural frequency, which can be approached by outside forces. This concept is illustrated by a mathematical theory later suggested by Theodore von Karman. On that day, the frequency of the wind was close to the bridge's natural frequency. This resulted in a very small denominator, which made the amplitude of the motion huge. Unfortunately, such science and mathematics were overlooked at the bridge's construction. Galloping Gertie's collapse drew attention to them, and it continues to be a challenging puzzle for engineers all over the world to study and learn from. When Galloping Gertie collapsed, hopeful newspapers speculated that it might be rebuilt within the year. Then, World War II struck, and Gertie's remains were seen as a valuable mass of steel, and the state paid workers to salvage the material. Meanwhile, Farquharson had conducted groundbreaking studies on the model bridge, greatly advancing wind tunnel testing. British engineer W. Austin came to study the Second Narrows Bridge to help plan an English suspension bridge. Quote, the whole of bridge engineering has profited by the fall of the Narrows Bridge. The subsequent research at the University of Washington is one of the most significant steps in bridge design in many, many years. Indeed, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was followed by the Mackinac Strait Bridge and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, both benefiting directly from the lessons it taught. Before launching plans for a second bridge, it was decided that the solution to offer least wind resistance was an open stiffening truss. No expense was spared in building the second Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The bridge had 33-foot stiffening trusses, wind grates, and hydraulic shock absorbers. It was the most technologically advanced bridge of the time, and the years of research in aerodynamics and mathematics triumphed in enriching the science of bridge engineering all over the world. A writer called the second Tacoma Narrows Bridge epoch-making. Galloping Gertie's sequel, fondly nicknamed Sturdy Gertie, set the standards for modern bridge design, terminating the trend of lighter, flimsier bridges. Wind tunnel testing is now mandatory for all suspension bridges. The second Tacoma Narrows Bridge picked up where its predecessor had left off. The tragedy of Galloping Gertie's collapse led to triumph, revolutionizing science and architecture, directing the change from light, flexible bridges to strong and dependable bridges, and bringing a wealth of new knowledge to the engineering world. And although an unprecedented initial success resulted in tragic failure, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge rose to triumph in the end. Stable, safe, and still beautiful, Sturdy Gertie remains as a lasting testament, power achieved by grace and artistry, and a triumph that has shaken itself out of the ashes of tragedy.